What's going on? My name is John Joe Lyons, and today I'm here to present to you my review for Antichrist. <laughs> Written and directed by Lars von Trier, Antichrist stars all of these lot. A grieving couple retreat to their cabin in the woods hoping to repair their broken hearts and troubled marriage. But nature takes its course and things go from bad to worse. Antichrist is a film that I've been afraid of taking on for quite some while now. I remember hearing about the things that the main characters have to go through in the film and after seeing the trailer I was like, nah, I'm good. As with so many of these, I was young and naive at the time, still somewhat unbroken. Thankfully those days are far behind us. After everything I've seen in the last year and a half though, Antichrist seems like a nice vacation away in the woods. Don't ask me why, but the subjects of depression and grief taken to the extreme just seems to speak to me these days, you know? And now finally, it's time that we take a trip to Eden. This is Antichrist. We join the characters of he and she as they have relations in the shower. We cut around the bathroom before suddenly cut into a close-up of going into then follow the couple as they land in bed. It's then we see that their baby monitor has the sound turned off, leaving the parents unaware as their little boy Nick hits the monitor trying to get the attention of his creator but going unheard. We briefly cut to three statues, those of pain, grief and despair, then watch as Nick leaves the safety of his cot. They continue to bang as we watch the child eventually make his way over to the window. Oh, I'll tell you what, the view out here. Mum, Dad, ain't it beautiful, eh? What a time to be a... Oh, the impact is also perfectly timed with the parents finishing, which takes some skill, I've got to tell you. We also see shots of the washing machine cleaning sheets, and I wonder what the significance of that could be. The washing clean of the past, the shot just looking nice in slow-mo, the sheets just being so caked in from their sessions, all are equally likely. Cut to chapter one, grief. Cut to Nick's funeral was the coffin is followed by the crying he and the emotionless she. They follow when suddenly she collapses to the shock of everyone around her. He rushes to her side when we cut to her hospital bed. He enters with flowers and sits by her side as she wakes up. She's confused about what day it is and he confirms it's Tuesday and that she's been here for a month. She asks if her grief is atypical to which he agrees. Cut to him complaining about Warren, her doctor, giving her too much medication saying that he is inexperienced. She tells him to trust others are smarter than you and reminds him that he is not a doctor. No, I'm not. And I'm proud that I'm not when I meet a doctor like him. She can barely open her eyes as she tells him that she knew Nick would sometimes wake up and walk about, that he could open the baby gate, that this is her fault. She begins to cry as he comforts her. Cut to him entering the room sometime later now in a suit. He tries to kiss her but is rejected. We discover that he has requested she come home, not satisfied with the treatment she is receiving and telling her that grief is an important part of the process and must not be removed. She says that he shouldn't treat her seeing as it's understood a therapist shouldn't treat their own family but he rejects this saying no one knows her like he does. She closes her eyes and we move on to the vase next to her through its glass and into its murky waters. Cut to him getting a letter from the King County Medical Examiner's Office. He puts the letter in his jacket and then moves through the house picking up one of Nick's toys on the way. He returns it to Nick's room and then finds she in the bathroom where she discards her medication. Hard cut to her crying next to a couple of Nick's teddy bears when she's joined by him. He hugs her as she tells him it hurts. He says there's no way around it and then she tells him she wants to die but he says he can't let her do that. I love the editing here and how perfectly it represents the ups and downs of crippling grief and depression. With her one minute almost cracking a smile as if she's on the mend, only for the next hard cut to find her doubled over in agony choking for air. The emotional whiplash really puts you in her position and it's f***ing brilliant. He tells her it'll change and hugs her again. Cut to the cup 
couple in bed. She wakes up seemingly shocked to be there and then accuses him of being distant. He asks for an example and she says last summer as a husband and a father, lamenting the loss that Nick experienced on his last summer alive. She says she never interested him until now. Now she's his patient but then stops, admitting she probably shouldn't talk about that. He corrects her saying there's nothing she can't talk about. She says he is indifferent to whether his child is dead or alive but he says he thought it was what she wanted. Being left alone with Nick to go off to Eden and finish her thesis which she then admits she never did to his shock. She says he made her feel as if her subject was glib. She says when she got to Eden it all felt like some kind of lie. He says he didn't see and she agrees. We dissolve to these trees then cut back to distorted shots of her trembling and sweating. We see the back of her head then cut to her waking up from this nightmare. He embraces her and takes her through a grounding exercise trying to calm her down. He tells her to imagine she is blowing on her thistle blooms. I'll blow on your thistle bloom, eh? And we cut to that very scene. The camera pans down and we see Nick with her. Cut back to the bedroom as she comes and he tells her that he told her there'd be a change. That she's still mourning but in a new phase. Anxiety. She says it's physical, dangerous. We see more shots of her nightmare as he explains the symptoms. Cut to her trying to bang him. He tells her this is unhealthy as she shouldn't f her therapist and then we cut to more calming techniques. Cut to her in the shower as he suggests that exposure might be the best option. He makes her a list of her worst fears even though she says she doesn't know what she's afraid of. Cut to her stumbling into the bathroom on the verge of an episode. Cut to her in the fetal position. She tries to get to the toilet but he stops her then drags her back to the bed where they bang. After they finish he admits this won't do and tries to ask instead of what scares her where she'd be most scared, feel most exposed. After a few suggestions, she says the woods. He asks what woods and she says Eden. They then start to mess around in bed laughing as they do before she suddenly bites him too hard. She apologises and he says it's okay. Hard cut to the camera rocketing through the woods as we see a flash of her screaming. In the reflection of the train window we see her face and then cut to him as he takes her through guided meditation. He describes her sinking into her seat and coming out at Eden. And look at this shot. What do you feel? It's a pleasant warmth and heaviness. It goes from handheld to a zoom and I just think it's so gorgeous. Cut to her on a bridge. She describes there being no birds and water that runs without sound. He asks if it's difficult to walk down there and she says it is not. She describes a foxhole and when asked what it's like, she says it's like walking through mud. She then describes a thick rotting tree. Penis metaphor. She arrives at the cabin and he tells her not to go in as it's the outside she's afraid of. He tells her to lie down on the plants, which she does. He asks what everything is like around her and she says green. We then watch as she melts into the green. I love the juxtaposition between the beautiful presentation and the absolute misery in the content. This is exactly the type of thing that makes me love extreme cinema. Cut back to the train as he reassures her once more. Cut to their taxi entering this forest. And if we see the bridge as a penis, the taxi is sperm and the woods is a vagina, I just get flashbacks of your mum. I mean, look at that. It's as if Lars von Trier has seen your mum's sopping lettuce. That's dumb. That's dumb. I'm sorry. Cut to the pair hiking through the woods. She stops and takes off her shoes, telling him the ground is burning. He tells her it isn't and helps her get the shoe back on. They continue on their trek when she says she wants to lie down for a minute. He agrees and they take off all their gear. Cut to her lying down asleep and enter him as he takes a wonder. A strong breeze hits him in the face, directing him elsewhere, and we cut to him discovering a deer. The deer watches him as he approaches and we see that a dead doe is hanging out the back of it. Is anyone else suddenly hungry? Everything goes dreamlike as the deer runs away, the baby falling out of her and he watches first in awe then fear. Cut to chapter 2 which begins with her finding him in the same place he was, now lying in the grass in deep thought. She asks if they should go on and he agrees. Cut to them reaching the bridge. They step up to it and she steps on with his support. She tries to go slow but eventually bolts across running further into the woods. He stands there for a bit then continues on passing the foxhole and the tree he gets to the cabin and we see another shaky POV before he walks into the shed passing this thing. He lays in bed with her and then finds some Polaroids of her and Nick when they were at the cabin. Cut to the couple asleep. They're awoken by a banging sound but she says it's just the stupid acorns. We watch them bounce off the roof and then cut to morning. He wakes up finding his arm out the window and his hand covered in ticks which he quickly removes before laying down again. Cut to her leaving the cabin to find he's setting up an exercise with rocks. He asks her to walk from one to the other which she finds immensely difficult. He talks her through it as her vision destroys thoughts and we cut to bare feet walking through the grass. We cut back as she arrives at the second stone. He congratulates her and she cries before almost smiling. Suddenly a baby bird falls out of a tree and is swarmed by ants before being 
picked up by a eagle? A kestrel? I don't know. I know f**k all about birds. Some f**k with wings. Let's leave it at that. Cut to her crying in bed. He kisses her and then we cut to them in the kitchen as he cooks. She says she's been afraid of here before, which he agrees seems likely. She says she became afraid and stopped writing. He asks what was different and we cut to the past. She's cutting out pictures, working on her thesis and we see the title, Gynocide. She hears Nick crying and runs out of the cabin to find him. She frantically runs through the brush, calling his name, finding herself on the bridge. She then runs back to the cabin and finds him playing happily while the cries still echo throughout the woods. We cut to this wide shot of the landscape and the crying slowly fades out to silence. He says Eden was the catalyst for her fear and that the scream wasn't real. Suddenly she attacks him, telling him he shouldn't have come here and calling him arrogant. She says maybe he won't last. Cut to later as she explains oak trees to him as acorns slam against the roof. She says that everything she thought was beautiful about about Eden was perhaps hideous. He dismisses this saying that that's what fear is, something that distorts reality, not the other way around. She says nature is Satan's church. They notice the window is open as she calls this Satan's brother. The acorns intensify as he crosses out Satan on the fear triangle and we cut back to the couple in bed. She talks about Nick drifting away from her and we cut to baby Nick running alone in the woods. Cut to him putting more wood in the burner. He looks for a match with no success finding the letter he stashed earlier. He opens it and reads as we see that she is asleep. And we get another one of those beautiful handheld to zoom shots and I don't know, I'm weirdly obsessed with these. Definitely stealing that, 100%. Cut to him being rained on by acorns. Cut to him outside in the morning as he's joined by her. He says that she looks like she slept well and she thanks him, saying that she did. She then tells him she loves him and asks if he slept okay. He says he did but just had crazy dreams. She says dreams are of no interest to modern psychology, Freud being dead then skips off into the woods. She then sticks her arm into the foxhole, stamps on the bridge and walks in the stream telling him that she is cured. He doesn't respond, clearly worried that this is some sort of act which is when she switches. She then storms off into the woods once more. He watches her go when a bush nearby rustles. He approaches the disturbance when the wind picks up, shaking all the shrubbery around him. He digs down, finding a disemboweled fox which seems to be eating itself. Chaos reigns. Hey! I know that guy! Cut to chapter 3, Despair, where he stands in the same place he was as it begins to rain. Cut back to the house where she is again in bed asleep and he notices a ladder outside and an attic door inside. He grabs the ladder, lights a lantern and heads up. Inside he finds loads of pictures depicting gynocide and torture before finding her thesis. Next to it, a depiction of the constellation The Three Beggars, Pain, Despair and Grief. And we see here the names of the two that we've already encountered. Pain, the fox, and Grief, the mother deer. He starts reading through her thesis and sees the writing slowly devolve into nonsense when a sudden crash is heard outside. We cut outside and see one of the branches on the tree break and fall. Cut to some time later as he takes her through one last exercise. He says it's like role playing and his role is all the thoughts that provoke her fear while hers is rational thinking. He says he is nature and she asks what Mr. Nature wants. He says to harm you, to kill you. She says, nature can't kill me, you're just tall greenery. He says, no, I'm more than that. She says she doesn't understand and he says he is outside but also within. The nature of man, the kind of nature that causes men to do evil things. The literature that you used in your research was about evil things committed against women, but you read it as proof of the evil of women? He gets frustrated saying that he can't work with her right now and then we cut to them banging as she cries, which is lovely. She begs him to hit her and he says that he doesn't want to and then she says, well that means that you don't love me. That's a tricky situation, brethren. I, uh, I wish you the best. She storms out of the cabin and then we cut to her at the roots of a tree strumming away, playing a f***ing guitar solo. He finds her, slaps her twice and then they start banging again when she says, Sisters from Rattlesman could start a hailstorm. <laughs> We get in close to his head, then pull back out to see bodies tangled up in the roots. Cut to morning as he lectures her on the injustices against women of the past. He tells her that this evil is her obsession and obsessions can never materialise. Like being hypnotised and that you can't be hypnotised into doing something you wouldn't normally do. Cut to her trying to get a fire going when she finds the letter that he was hiding. He tells her it's a copy of the autopsy report on Nick. She asks what they found and he says nothing that would have any bearing on the case. This suggesting for the first time that actually the couple are still under investigation 
regarding Nick's death. Cut to him reading the report when we hear that Nick had a slight deformity of the bone structure of his feet. He then shows her a picture of Nick where we can see that she has put his shoes on the wrong feet, causing the deformity. She is surprised by this, saying that it must have been a slip of the mind that day. He leaves and enters the shed looking at more pictures of Nick. In all the pictures, his shoes are on the wrong feet. We see a quick shot of her putting on Nick's shoes as he cries and then cut back as she attacks him. Oh. Ah. She says he's going to leave her, but he says he isn't. She then whips out his d and jumps on. He tells her he loves her, but she says she doesn't believe him. She then jumps off and then smashes him in the dick so fucking hard that it makes him pass out. Just a one time but. <laughs> and he just goes to sleep. What the f He's just off. She then wicks him off until he comes blood. Blood come. The cornerstone of any extreme horror film. If someone doesn't come blood in your movie, what are we even doing here? She then gets the giant weight, screws a f***ing hole in his leg, slides the weight on and bolts it in place. Cut to outside as she discards the wrench under the house. Cut to him waking up in a great deal of pain and seeing what's happened. He tries to remove the weight but can't. He checks the toolbox for the wrench but finds nothing then drags himself outside. Cut to her searching for him and then to him hiding in the foxhole. Which, you know, f***ing fair enough. She stumbles off screaming for him as inside he lights a match finding a black bird buried. This is despair. The bird suddenly comes to life and we cut to her searching. She hears despair and goes in search of the sound as he beats it to death. It lays there motionless before coming back to life once again. He tries to kill it again but it's too late. She finds him and tries to drag him out of the hole. She then goes and grabs a shovel hitting him with it until a rock falls over the foxhole entrance. She climbs on top and furiously digs while screaming as we fade to black and begin chapter 4. The Three Beggars it's now night and she removes the loose soil finding him passed out. She drags him free of the hole as he wakes and asks her to get the weight off of his leg. She looks for the wrench in the toolbox then returns saying she can't find it, seeming to have forgotten what she did with it earlier. She then lifts the weight and helps him back to the cabin. Inside he asks if she wants to kill him but she says not yet. She says when the three beggars arrive someone must die. She then hugs him and breaks down in tears. She kisses him, takes off her trousers, gets some scissors and lays next to him. She takes his hand and gets him to touch her and then we see a shot of her watching Nick climb up onto the table. She cries continuing to touch herself when we see another shot of Nick falling as she watches emotionless. She then asks him to hold her. We then get to the bit that I've been dreading. She takes the scissors and then snips off her clitoris. Mm -mm. She screams as we cut to grief in the woods outside. She then leaves the cabin and sits in the grass. Cut to him waking up and looking at the stars outside, realising there is no such constellation. She says none of it is any use and this is echoed by a dark form of her. The hail begins to fall as pain enters with a bell around its neck. He sits up and upon hearing despair, call from beneath, breaks the floorboards, releasing him and discovering the wrench. The three beggars then sit with her as he tries to remove the weight. She attacks him with the scissors, but he's able to fend her off long enough to remove it. We see blurry close-ups of him before he stands and pins her to the wall. He then strangles her to death. Cut to the morning as he douses her dead and naked body in gasoline and sets her aflame. Cut to the dick tree as we see a load of dead bodies suddenly materialise. Cut to the title card, epilogue. The screen is now once again black and white as it was in the prologue. We see him stumbling through the brush before sitting and eating a bunch of berries. Behind him he sees the ghosts of the three beggars and then he stands to see he is being approached by hundreds of women, their faces blurred out. We cut to a wide shot as they approach and the film slowly fades to black. The end. Well, I gotta tell you, that's another one for the favourite films of all time pile. Antichrist is another film that fits perfectly into my new favourite subgenre. Incomprehensible misery. The kind of misery that cuts deep through the flesh, past the muscle and scrapes the bone. I'm not going to try and understand why this is my speed at the moment, but here we are. Antichrist deals with a certain type of misery. The misery of grief and loss. And the misery is made all the more arduous by the subject of the loss being that of a young child. As many of you could imagine, a loss of that magnitude would 
would, could and does have an overwhelmingly destructive effect on the parents' lives and this film does its best to represent that almost unrepresentable pain. This film is the first part of the Depression trilogy from director Lars von Trier, a collection of films meant to be an artistic outlet for Trier's own mental health struggles and I think his personal pain is the reason the film is so successful. His direction, shot composition and editing is also super on point. I love every aspect of the presentation here and can only congratulate Trier on producing one of the most beautiful films I have ever had the pleasure of viewing. While on the surface the story is simple, the real draw here is the stunning performances from the leads. He is a character who seems to mean well but makes poor decisions due to his own arrogance and inflated sense of self at least on the surface. After the death of their child you could argue that he feels a lack of control, unable to save his son. He is now intent on saving her from the pain and misery she suffers from. Unfortunately, born from good intentions or not, his decision to remove her from the hospital and her doctor's care, to convince her to stop taking her medication, to isolate her from society and make her his sole responsibility creates a perfect storm wherein the true madness can cultivate and explode in a flurry of penis smashing and vagina mutilation. Wah wah. Willem Dafoe is as usual fantastic in the role. Although his subconscious desire for control is clear, Dafoe plays the character with genuine heart. He believes what he is doing is right and the only way to save his wife's soul from this unending torture. Even at the end when he is strangling her to death, there is a sadness and bewilderment behind his eyes that speaks volumes. With the character of She, it's a little more complicated. At first we sympathise with her, feeling her pain and anguish and like he, we hope beyond hope that she'll make it out the other side but it's only when we see her what Watching Nick climb onto the table and out of the window do we truly understand why she feels the guilt that she does. The question then becomes why? Why she didn't react and why she looked so emotionless as she watched? Is this because of some kind of pre-existing mental health issue? We learn nothing about her life before Nick so whether or not there was something wrong prior to his birth cannot be determined. If Nick's birth is the cause of her illness, some sort of postnatal depression, then her actions or lack thereof become clearer. Whether conscious of it or not, putting Nick's shoes on wrong suggests a desire to inflict pain. The only thing that isn't clear is whether she wants the pain to be specifically inflicted upon Nick or the world. She is a character that seems to be filled with a quiet hatred, first for Nick, then herself. And it makes me wonder if she actually feels guilt for Nick and therefore hates herself or just uses herself as an outlet for her own rage. Charlotte Gainsborough is of course fantastic fantastic in the role and slowly becoming one of my favourite actors. She seamlessly switches from soul shattering heartbreak to mindless rage with an unparalleled skill not to mention having the incredible courage to do what she does in the film. She reminds me of Isabella Gianni in that way but takes it much further. As great as Defoe is, this is her film and she absolutely shines. The other main character I'd like to mention is The Cabin. I love the setting as it invokes feelings of classic horror. The suggestion being that the threat will come from outside, from the nature that she fears. We almost expect to see the POV of some evil force flying around the woods evil dead style but in reality the real threat comes from within. From the self-hatred that she feels which I think is a really nice touch. That being said the fact that they call the area Eden is a bit on the nose. In terms of the violence on display here I can't help but feel a little disappointed. After all the trepidation I had going into this movie, I'm surprised to say that it actually isn't really that violent or extreme in the traditional sense. There are only two scenes in the film that are noteworthy, those being the blood c*** and the old snip snip, and while both of those are pretty gnarly, it did make me wonder why this film is considered as extreme as it is. The answer is that the extremity lies in the emotional torture, all the sex and that one shot of unsimulated penetration. Speaking of that one shot, it kind of annoyed me and I wonder why Trier bothered to include it. If there was more of the same throughout the film, I'd understand but it's the only time it happens and that just makes me feel as if it was intended to shock rather than serve the story in any way. I feel like it's just there so they can advertise the film as featuring unsimulated sex and that just feels dishonest in a way. Really apart from the snip snip in the end Antichrist is pretty tame. So now the question is, what does it all mean? Who is the Antichrist? You could argue that the titular Antichrist is Nick, but what if Antichrist is another name for humanity itself, with he taking the role of Satan and she the role of God? The pair bump uglies create life and then go on to ignore their creation and allow it to destroy itself. After humanity's death, they return to Eden where Satan attempts to coerce God into his way of thinking, to create the version of life on earth he envisions. When she rejects this, he kills her and is then met with an army of subjects willing to become the new mother, the new God. God. This final revelation shows that Satan was always the dominant force, always in charge. He just wanted a willing partner in God. 
And who's to say she's even the original god? Perhaps she is another in a long line of failures on Satan's part. In the end, the cycle starts again as Satan is doomed in his own hell to repeat this over and over. Antichrist is a wonderful film. It's dark, painful and incredibly well made with direction and performances that I would say are as near to perfection as they can be. I can't believe I waited this long to see it and I highly recommend you set some time aside to watch it immediately. It's a lot, but it's worth it. So that was my review of Antichrist. What do you lot think? For me, it's up there with Possession. I really really liked this film. There's a lot that can be taken from this one, so if you have any thoughts that I didn't touch upon, please let's discuss it in the comments below. As always, I want to say thank you for watching, commenting, leaving likes. Every day we get closer to 10,000 subscribers and it's all you guys, so I really f***ing appreciate it. Thank you. If you want to support the channel more and get access to the uncut version of this video, plus others, please go over to patreon.com forward slash John Joe Lyons. There's going to be extra little bits over the coming months, but for now I'm just trying to concentrate on getting these videos out. But if you want to support the channel, please head over there and just donate whatever you can. I really appreciate it and Lord knows I f***ing need it. But in the meantime, thank you all for watching. My name's John Joe Lyons and how hard do you have to hit somebody in the d to make them just immediately pass out? Good Lord.